All right. We are at noontime. It is wonderful to be with you all. Thank you for joining us. We have a special edition of webinars for busy lawyers this week due to it being Wellbeing Week in Law. My name is Laura, my law practice advisor here at Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, and I am delighted to be able to introduce our panel today. So first, uh, we have my colleague, Sean Healy, who is one of our clinicians at Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers. He is an excellent counselor um, and speaker. And uh, Sean will give a presentation on our topic, which is a laugh a day keeps the doctor away, humor's role in our well-being as lawyers. And then after his presentation, we're going to incorporate two lawyers who also perform some comedy from our legal uh, community. That is uh, Daniel Feneff and Nadine Ezzi. To give you a little bit of background about them, Nadine is a legal transformation consultant and attorney with almost 20 years of legal and related experience working at the intersection of law, innovation, and technology. And Daniel is the principal attorney at the FNAF Law Group, a civil litigation firm representing plaintiffs in sexual assault and serious injury cases. And he also performs uh, some improv and comedy now. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sean. And I wanna thank all of you um, for attending. And to let you know, this video will be available afterwards on demand if you signed up as well as on our website, lclna.org. And if you have questions, we invite you to put them in Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. Thank you so much. Sean, over to you. Thanks, Laura. I'm gonna share my screen, use a couple of slides. So as Laura said, uh, this is uh, Wellbeing in Law Week. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about, I'm gonna talk a little bit about humor and how that is an essential part of our well-being. And then we'll get into more of a conversation. So I just want to start off with um, sort of addressing the elephant in the room. I think doctors are often maligned. Um, the title of this presentation is inappropriate. So a laugh a day, keeping the doctor away. Right? Doctors are nice people. Okay, I'm a doctor, not a real doctor like my dad likes to say, but I am a doctor. I have a doctorate. So... I think it's mean to try to keep us away from you. Um, we're nice people, we try to help. And so, yeah, let's, let's try not to be so mean. Uh, we got a chat here. Sean, Laura says, I, Sean. I, I, I was gonna say, <laughs> just bursting out laughing right now. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And, I, and Laura, I see your chat here, it says, Sean, you wrote the title. <laughs> I know that was a, that was a joke, but you're 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 ruining it for me. <laughs> Laura says, Sean, only you can see this chat. Stop reading it out loud. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's move on. So another another uh, common phrase you hear is like laughter is the best medicine. So there's lots of benefits to laughter. All right, so we're going to get into a little bit more of that uh, in a while. Just want to give you some some warnings, kind of like lawyers give you those, you know, the fine print. I want to make sure that you don't think of laughter as being the best medicine in terms of its most effectiveness for everything. So there are things that you should take medicine for. Um, it's really uh, in your best interest to treat um, certain things with medicine and not just laugh about them. But medicine um, or laughter can be a, a great form of medicine for our daily life. And uh, specifically, at least according to the Mayo Clinic where doctors, real doctors work, um, a, a regular dose of laughter uh, helps our stress system, our stress relief sort of uh, reverse. So stress in our lives gets our bodies and our brains uh, sort of uh, activated to uh, respond to a threat and laughter helps to, to reverse that and get us into a more relaxed state. Right? So it has a direct impact on our immune system. It actually helps with pain relief. I know that there are times when laughing actually hurts if you have like a you know, injury or something. But aside from that, um, you can actually reduce pain by laughter. 
Laughter is also a, a great way to increase resilience. And one specific way that it does that is because when we can find something humorous about something serious, we're exercising a little more control of the situation. So it's not just this thing happening to us, we are now interacting with it. And so whenever we're able to, to sort of see our situation and identify something that's humorous about it, it can help us feel more resilient, feel more in control in that situation. Um, obviously it improves our mood. So most people, when they're laughing, their, their mood increases. Right? And also it strengthens, strengthens social connections. So one of the you know, most popular thing to do with your friends is to laugh, right? Just sharing a laugh, having that connection when something is funny to multiple people, it's a great way to connect. It's a great way to build relationships and also have fun with others. Um, also, if you're feeling a lack of social connection, right, laughter is a great way to increase that. You've often probably heard the, the phrase that laughter is contagious in a good way. Um, so just sitting next to somebody, like hearing them laugh can make something more funny. I know this is true for me sitting on the couch watching a funny movie. My wife starts laughing at something that I wouldn't have laughed at out loud. And suddenly I start laughing out loud because it became funnier because she's laughing. And so we can benefit from the joy and laughter of others in a way that uh, if, we're, if we're struggling to find something funny or to benefit from laughter, just being right next to somebody who is enjoying it can be a great way to sort of, you know, ride that wave that someone else is creating. Um, a couple of things to point out about humor. Um, you, can, you can exercise humor in a way that connects us to others. You can also exercise humor in a way that separates us. So uh, my recommendation to you is to focus on humor that connects and validates, right? When, when we find something funny uh, in a way that sort of validates our experience. It shows us somebody else sees it our way or is making fun of it in a way that we can understand. That connects us and draws us closer. There are uh, forms of humor that sort of focus on harm, right? Like making fun of or belittling somebody else. And even though as a psychologist, I can't read your minds, but when that's your go-to form of humor, you're actually saying more about yourself than you are about the situation or the joke. So uh, you can't necessarily control uh, what you find funny in the moment. But my, uh, my thought is it's helpful to recognize why something is humorous. Right? Sometimes, speaking for, my, for myself, uh, I'll laugh at a joke made by a comedian or in a movie. And um, I'll use my wife again. She, she won't laugh. And she's like, that, that was mean. That joke was mean. And my response is like, oh, the thing that the joke is about isn't what they said. They're actually making a joke about the underlying system or they're actually making a self-deprecating joke, sort of using themselves as, as fodder. So it's helpful to know why something is funny um, because then again, one, you'll understand it more and you'll also be able to explain it to others if you all of a sudden are laughing at something and someone's like, wow, I thought you were a nice person. You're a jerk. I'm like, well, Actually, this is why it's funny. Another thing that humor is helpful for um, is as a, uh, an indicator, All right? So specifically changes in humor. Um, I'll use myself again as an example. Uh, stress um, pops up as a change in humor for me. So years ago, I was working at a job um, running some clinics as a very stressful job. And I had, I had worked there for a while in different roles. So I had worked there as an intern and then sort of ascended to you know, a position of responsibility. And so my colleagues who'd known me for a while knew me as a funny person. And after a while of sort of taking on more responsibility, uh, what they saw was like, oh, you're uh, one person in particular said, I haven't seen you laugh in a while. You haven't made any jokes in a while. And for me, I, I didn't notice it. I just thought like, oh, this is just a stressful job. But once I thought about it, I was like, she's right. I have not laughed in a while. And so that was a helpful thing for me 
to uh, to hear from my colleague and friend and also to assess like what is it that the stress is doing it's taking something away that's really important to me and my identity um, changes in humor can also be uh, an effect of burnout right increased anxiety feeling depressed it could also be a, a indicator of cognitive decline so uh, people who are experiencing the early onsets of like alzheimer's or mild cognitive uh, decline their their type of humor changes so instead of appreciating and, and this is uh, with a caveat of if they appreciated this before um, their ability to appreciate sarcasm starts to go away and but their ability to mean to appreciate like slapstick humor persists so again just changes in humor are important to pay attention to I know people in my life who have never appreciated sarcasm. So the fact that they don't appreciate sarcasm now is not an indication of anything wrong. That's just how they've always been. And finally, uh, I get this question a lot. Um, the idea of, you know, fake it till you make it. If I'm feeling like I'm discouraged, I'm anxious, I'm burnt out. And you've said, you know, laughter is so important. Should I be faking it? Should I just you know, pretend like I'm... I'm, I'm having a good time. Will I get that the benefit? And there's a very clear distinction in this fake it till you make it. If you're using it for yourself, right? If you're uh, trying to benefit from the experience of laughter, right? Or to, to smile, even though you're not feeling happy at the moment, you can have a benefit from that. But it really is a one way. Uh, the positive use of it is one way. It's for you. All right, so, you know, pretending to laugh, you might get a boost in your mood. The negative use is when you're doing it for somebody else. If you're trying to pretend that you're happy for someone else's benefit, so they don't ask, or so that they don't worry, that is not a good use of fake it till you make it. So, I just want to draw that clear line uh, in terms of a, a helpful way to sort of. Uh, Engage in laughter, even when you're not feeling all that chipper, you can try to benefit personally. But my strong recommendation is don't, don't use it to, for other people's benefit to, to fool them. So that is where I'm gonna leave it in terms of clinical information about laughter and, and comedy. And now we're gonna hear from people who are actually funny. So, Laura introduced Nadine and Daniel. Um, both of you are lawyers and both of you made a decision to actively engage in comedy in, in different ways. So first I just wanna ask both of you, maybe we'll start with Nadine, like what got you into comedy and sort of what does that look like for you? Dr. Healy, thank you so much. That's thank you, question. finally. You're, listen, it's all about validation. I know, okay. right? Thank you. Uh, you're most welcome. And thank can you. Can for I give actually... you my dad's number? Oh, yeah. Can you, can you call my dad? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll call your dad. That's thanks. fine. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a really good question. And first off, thanks for those slides and those pointers. Those were actually wonderful. I think a couple factors for me. So first off, I come from an incredibly funny family. I mean, humor has been part of my life as long as I can remember. My parents, my sisters, aunts, uncles, Give me a gathering and a big handle of Johnny Walker Red, and you know everybody's going to be laughing pretty quickly. So it's it's been part of me from the get go. I'd say I've always been a funny person. Uh, started when I was much younger as a way to cope with the absolute absurdity and awkwardness of adolescence. Being an little eleven year old with a unibrow and a mustache rivaling that of Marcho, Groucho Marx wasn't exactly easy. So you know you have to learn to kind of be funny at some point. And so you know today. I can't help but observe the absurdity of everything. And I just, I have to make fun of it. And so with that, I'm with my friends, with my family, everyone's like, God, you're so funny. Have you ever thought of getting on stage? And I just dismissed it for the longest time. I was like, no, I can't because I'm a lawyer and lawyers don't do that. And honestly, like all joking aside, that really was like, I, I can't do that because I'm doing this. And in the last couple of years, uh, you know, I moved to Boston about five years ago and my friends here like, no, no, seriously, we're not, we're not joking now. You're really funny. Like, have you ever thought of getting on stage? And I guess I was at a point in my career where I felt established enough and we can get into this later, what I'd really shunned so much of the expectations of attorneys already. So I said, why the hell not? So I enrolled in an eight week 
intro to stand up comedy class at Improv Boston here. This was right before COVID. And honestly, it was the best thing I ever did, uh, not only for my per personal life, but my professional life as well. Um, and so, yeah, so I started doing open mic nights around Boston. COVID then, it was having a blast, by the way. I don't think I've ever felt more liberated in my life than getting on stage and grabbing that microphone. Uh, but then COVID hit. Uh, so I really haven't had the opportunity to get back on stage since. However, uh, so much writing material from lockdown and from COVID. So I really look forward to getting back on stage and putting that to work. So that's just a bit of background of how I, I got into comedy. Did you have any reservation about getting on stage? Did you have to work through any like initial hesitation that or was, anxiety? That's such a good question. Yes, um, absolutely. So first off, I was about the oldest person in my class by about 15 years. So that helped, right? Like, you know, you already walk in feeling like a clown. <laughs> you go in and you look around, you're like, oh yeah, I am. Like, that's great. <laughs> so, so I think that helped a little bit actually because of my lived experiences. Um, and then the whole class is working you to that point to get on stage. And actually the first thing our instructor said the first day was so helpful. And it's actually lessons that I've taken in every aspect of my life. He said, there's three keys. And, and Daniel, I don't know about you and how you got into it, what you went through, but he said, there's three keys to being a successful comedian. Okay. He said, be vulnerable, silence your inner critic, and speak your truth. And honestly, if there weren't three instructions for just how to live a good authentic life, I don't know what else there were. So keeping those in mind, every class going through the, you know, through the assignments, the assignments were essentially, we had to work up to a five minute bit on stage for graduation. So, you know, we had to get on stage, we had to work it for our workshop, it for our peers, they gave us feedback. Um, but keeping those three tenants in mind, honestly was very helpful. And then on, you know, and I took that into my work as well. I took that into how I presented to opposing counsel or to my corporate clients or whatnot. And it's honestly been uh, really game changing for me as well. And then the actual getting on stage. Yeah, I had a couple beers. Like, I'm not gonna lie. When I went to do my first open mic night, I, I they were Coors Light, so they weren't really anything. Yeah, but I mean, but once I got on stage and I grabbed the microphone and and I just started having that relationship with the audience, uh, that that trumped any that trumped anything else. So that was that was great. That was awesome. That was cool. Thanks, Nadine. Daniel, what about you? How'd you get into improv and comedy? Um, thank you, Dr. Healy. Um, thank you. Un unlike Attorney Ezzy's, uh, you know, story about getting involved, she's very talented. My comedic gene comes from a deep-rooted feeling of insecurity. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I grew up feeling very uncomfortable, and I noticed that in... Um, woodshop class, which we all had to take back in the day, um, I would be joking around and there were some girls that I had my eye on that were like, you're really funny. And I'm like, that's the first time they've ever talked to me. So I'm going to do this forever. Um, <laughs> and uh, slowly I started exploring that. I have one story that I don't know is appropriate. I mean, I know we're all adults here, but uh, it's a little... Uh, little risque so maybe i'll hold off on that unless you guys are dying for me to tell it um i can't tease it like that and just leave it hanging. okay so so here's the deal young boys do weird stuff and i'm with my friend and this is where i thought maybe there could potentially be a future um he got his hands on some magazines which had certain phone numbers in it where you could try and call and like talk to women women we shouldn't have been talking to but we don't have a credit card or anything so I thought it would be a funny bit that I would pretend to be a guy with an accent who didn't understand how the process worked. And the woman who was trying to take our credit card information, I pretended she was the woman we were supposed to be talking flirtatiously with. Um, so I would do that like every weekend. And they knew us at this number and thought it was hilarious. They put us out like on speakerphone in this weird like 900 number uh, phone bank. Um, and, uh, we just died, uh, laughing, uh, the, all those nights. And, uh, I was like, wow, this is, you know, for an uncomfortable kid, that was a release. And, um, I, as I went to school, uh, I was known as a little bit of a, you know, class clown in high school. That's how I like made relationships. <laughs> and that's how I fit in was being the funny kid. And then in college, I started doing theater. 
and then got on the uh, improv team, which if anybody's been, uh, everybody here has probably been to college, right? Um, college improv can be rough. <laughs> it can be rough. Um, so mostly the, the, the audience is full of your friends and, and people who've had a few course lights and, uh, and, you know, you start to get better, start to get better. I got invited to audition for this place, Improv Asylum in the North end of Boston, which is, they claim is the largest comedy theater in the Northeast because they just would sell out 200 seats, you know, multiple times a night. Um, and it was a blend of sketch and improvised comedy. And I remember being a student um they, they, that theater used to teach our troupe and i'd go to their shows and think there's no way I'm, i'd ever be able to do what those people on the main stage are doing like that just seems like light years beyond what i was capable of doing but after you know many years i was there and then uh having a ball you know or we would we, we the next stop to us was like saturday night live you know and in a few of my the people I've worked with have gone on to Saturday Night Live and, and CBS and stuff. Um, but I went to law school and that's where my dreams died. Um, so that that's it, John. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I think somebody posed a question, which I was going to ask. Basically, um, do you use either improv or comedy in your professional work? Nadine, you mentioned that you do. But how does that actually look? Right, like how, how do you decide when when comedy or or different approach is appropriate versus not? Well, I think um, we had talked about this before, Nadine. Uh, like, it, it, uh, I think on the West Wing, it's, they call it a charm and disarm. So, comedy, you know, used with a scalpel can alleviate tension in a room. Um, and but uh, for me, <laughs> there's a line you have to learn where it is um i've i've heard uh, that and, and i think it's true that uh, especially as an employer or someone who deals with very serious stuff like lawyers do um you can be funny but don't be silly because then people stop taking you seriously so you can charm people and, and seem um i think um colloquial or 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 uh you're or, you know kind of uh you know like you're down to earth and have a sense of humor but if you do that too much people start to question you. at least that's been my experience i don't know about me i echo everything that you just said uh especially uh, trial and error walking that line right and having to figure out there have been many times where i've sensed that tension in a room so i don't litigate i'm a corporate transactional attorney so uh, the boardroom, right, so to speak, you know, is our is our courtroom, and you've got that tension, and it's just palpable, and you can sense almost that it will impact a negotiation adversely, and you want to alleviate that tension a bit, just so you're bringing at least the best versions of everybody to the table, and so there have been times where you try to use humor, humor, crack a joke, kind of alleviate that tension. I've bombed sometimes, <laughs> like you know, that's that line that Daniel's talking about, trial and error. But um, you know, the more the more you learn and kind of learn to read a room, really pause a little bit, just kind of read a room, read the people, uh, sit back a little bit before trying to do it, so you're a bit more effective. Um, also, you know, I've used humor many times to combat sexism, uh, especially when I was a younger attorney and knew that what I was experiencing was wrong. But let's be honest, didn't have the guts to speak up because I was a brand new lawyer and didn't think I had that power or agency to do so. But being kind of the smart aleck that I am, you know, sometimes, and Sean, excuse me, Dr. Healy, back to your point, I use humor in order to react to a situation where I might otherwise blow up or be angry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, say I'm working for, you know, a, a firm back in the day and the partners who I knew well said something that I found to be sexist, right? And, and I wanted them to know, but I didn't want to make a thing of it at the time and look, well, you know, it's just that pesky X chromosome that I carry. It just makes everything so much more difficult, you know, and, and they, and they pause and they, they get what you're saying and they're like, okay, you know, heard, respect that and, and go on. So I've used it many, many times in that regard as well. Not only to speak up for myself, but other people as well used in the same vein. So, yeah. That's great. In terms of, uh your professional life versus your personal life. Obviously, you're one of the things that that I talk to lawyers about a lot is like you're not two separate 
beings, right? You're not you're not a a personal person, and then you're not uh, somebody totally different as a lawyer. So to to feel like you can integrate those two is really helpful. Um, how do you use this in your personal life, and and how does it contribute to your well being if it does? Dan, you want to go? Sure. Yeah. Um, I. <laughs> I'll use the uh, example of meeting my wife, who's, she's a concert fan. And when we were first, I mean, I think anytime anybody's going on dates, you know, you want to project the most perfect version of yourself, which is such a bad idea <laughs> because <laughs> then you said these. It's all downhill after that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um, and I, I, and we, we talk about this, but for the first few dates, I thought I couldn't, you know, I have to just subtly hint at, the charitable work I do, um, and not talk, you know, not be too, uh, not be too much of myself, because, you know, maybe that'll be too much, uh, too quickly. But once I started uh, unveiling a little bit more of my personality, which can be extremely silly, um, and uh, she, she was, she was relieved <laughs> that uh, I wasn't just this stuffy person. And, and uh, I've, I've struggled with because as lawyers, I mean, I don't, I think anybody who says that being a lawyer is is, is fun um, isn't telling all the story because it's, you deal with a lot of stressful situations. I mean, you, it takes time, I think, to get there where it's not so stressful, but taking home that stress um, and not, not being able to, um, you know, let the, the steam out of your head uh, from the workday, not that garnering steam is a good plan while you're at the office, but um, it's it's a good uh, indication when you're laughing, um, a, a good reminder of the person that I, you are. Um, and so using comedy uh, in my personal relationships with family, I come from an Irish family, um, there's hardly a serious word that's exchanged, um, but with my own personal friendships, um, I try not to take myself too seriously. You know, it's easy to get caught up in our accolades and our titles and what we do for a living, you know, and, and probably just after passing the bar, I was like, hi, Dan, a uh, fan of uh, attorney of all. Uh, that's how I would introduce myself. By the way, I'm a lawyer. I don't know if you want to know. Um, but now it's like, that's the last thing I really want to talk about, you know, because I'm a little bit more comfortable with myself. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I think we work so hard for is not to look important, but to, to be able to, um, help people and, uh, remain, uh, keep our personality intact. Not sure if that answered the question, but. Yeah, absolutely. I actually couldn't have said it better. You have to, you have to find a way to not take this all so seriously. I mean, the demands that are put on us. Uh, you know, whether you're in a firm by your clients, by your colleagues, by every, I mean, it's just so much, you know, the demands to present a certain way, be a certain way, you know, show up a certain way. Uh, it's so easy to lose yourself. It really, really is. And I think we all went through that, especially as we were uh, baby lawyers, so to speak, faking it till we made it. And so, you know, it, it does take time to, as Dan just, you know, so wonderfully said to get to a point where you are comfortable with yourself, right? You know, I, um, and can remember that, you know, we're here for a blink of an eye. And what's it really all about, right? It's about making an impact where we can and try not to take yourself so seriously. So, um, you know, again, that's where I use humor as well as to just try to kind of keep things as, um, you know, lighthearted as possible. So. Uh, I would add, I want, uh, when Nadine was mentioning sort of using humor it, it, and it goes along with what your, uh, presentation involved as well. So I really want people to pay attention to this because it's a great point. Um, but uh, as far as using humor to convey a point without completely dismissing it, like the sexism stuff, um, but also not using it to just uh, ignore the problem or cover it up, but actually address it. And I find that sometimes with, with certain individuals or certain groups of people, that rather than addressing something head on and being like, you know, actually what you said really made me feel uncomfortable might be the wrong approach with them. And so you can, you can, you know, and even with clients, you need to talk about some serious thing or serious problems, you know, and, and people are really gung ho about their perspective. It's like, 
Well, actually, the way that looks, and you, you some funny way of putting it, they get the point and they don't get offended. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I use that in my, my personal life too. Um, to when when I'm establishing boundaries with my family or friends, it's like, look, relax. <laughs> yeah. 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 I actually see a question really quick uh, that was posed about 10 minutes ago when I was talking about the boardroom and it said, can you give us an example of how humor benefited you in the boardroom? Um, so it, really quickly, I, I specialize in commercial real estate. So one of the times I'm around a table is if, you know, we're trying to negotiate an 80 plus page lease agreement that's been redlined and you bring both sides to the table to hammer it out and you're in there, you know, an hour, hour and a half, you can sense the fatigue in the room, right? You've really made really great progress, but maybe there's five or six points left that we have to get to. You're losing folks. You can tell that the quality, so to speak, of the negotiation is starting to fray. So, you know, we're getting to a point in the clause, a clause in the lease that it's important, but it's not that important. And so I might just say, well, you know, and now to section 32, which is the reason why we're all here today, right? Is, you know, which is some, and then everybody laughs because they're like, it, it's an inconsequential clause, right? That we're, that we're fighting over or whatever, right? And it just kind of brings to light, hey, like, let's just, let's, let's make sure we're focusing on the things that matter and be as efficient as possible. Let's wrap this up efficiently for our client's sake, for our sake and all that. And it, it's quite effective. And it's, so that's just one example I can think of off the top of my head. I also saw a question about, um, can you prepare for spontaneity? And, and the first thing that popped in my mind is that's improv. Correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, but like <laughs> practicing improv is practicing or preparing to sort of be spontaneous to sort of go with whatever comes your way and to find uh, the humor in the moment. Sure. Yeah. And, and a lot of it um, is being uncomfortable, uh, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, I think in any given circumstance where something unexpected happens, uh, the thing we say about improv and why it can be done um, is because there are very low expectations <laughs> on what happens. People are <laughs> impressed with the stupidest things when they know you're making it up. Um, you know, I've, so many um, old women have come up to me after a show and been like, now a lot of that stuff was scripted, right? You know, or, or you know, young kids going like, that's not, you're lying. Um, and I can't believe that they're that impressed with what I consider to be just a flop of a show, you know? And, and, and so, I think um, in, in, in circumstances where the uh, unpredictable does happen, the people who are observing that conversation or situation are in the same boat and they don't expect the, the person who might be speaking to address it perfectly. And so you have time and then there's a concept and an improv, which um, I could talk about, but it, yes and. You know, you, you accept the situation for what it is and then you build upon it. And so um, that takes practice. Uh, you go to level one improv court, uh, classes and it is awful. Uh, you know, and, and mine was too when I started doing it. Um, and you get, you know, hours and hours and hours. And, you know, I'd, I'd want to take, I taught for briefly after I was on the main stage um, and then before law school, um, I would like to take people to, Park Street Station. All right, now here we're, you're going to perform for these people, <laughs> and that's not going to go well for you. Um, and let's just get comfortable with the fact that we can't control everything. Um, and so, if you if you if you maintain your personality um, and, and your sense of humor, um, the expectations are very low, and uh, you know that's all people are expecting. Dan, somebody's asking you where you go to study improv. Um, I would recommend, uh, I mean, if you're, if you want to make a career out of it, um, you can start anywhere, but then go to second city and, uh, uh or, or the upright citizens brigade in, in New York. But, um, where I, where I was teaching and performed is improv asylum in the North end. I don't think improv Boston is as a space right now. Um, they don't, yeah, they don't due to COVID. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Norm Lavalette. Tell them Dan Fanoff sent you. Uh, there's classes one through six, and then you put on a show. Like, I think so. There might be eight week classes you meet every week with people, you know, and, and people go there 
they're very uncomfortable or it's trying to get over stage fright. I mean, that's the word. There used to be a thing, naked stand up at Improv Boston. Um, I heard of it. I heard my instructor I did saw, it. I was like, it was what? nationally known. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was weird. It was weird. Did you um, do it? No. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, I'm comfortable with myself, uh, but they uh, they they had a naked a nude st stand up session just so it's really for the comedians to go and then any show yeah. you do after that is not going to be that difficult. But I would say Improv Asylum in in Boston um, they have a great program um, and uh, yeah, there's no pressure um, and then you can put on a show and then they have levels of you know after you do your your um schooling uh there's something called house teams which you can audition for and then the nxt cast and then if you're lucky and you're the best you get on the main stage um and uh that's that was just such a wonderful part of my life so yeah that's what i would recommend those are great i want to add in someone has added in union comedy in somerville is another place that they would recommend to try working on your practice of uh stretching your muscle of comedy if you have other suggestions please feel free to drop them in the chat or the q a and also speaking of working on your muscle for comedy someone had asked about laughter yoga are any of you familiar with it and before um, I turn it over for that, I will note too that as part of lawyers' concern for lawyers, our colleague, Dr. Tracy, teaches um, yoga for busy lawyers on Thursdays at 2 p.m. It's 20 minutes. It's a great community where she does different sorts of yoga for that. Um, but as to the question of laughter yoga, I personally am not familiar. Sean, Daniel, Nadine, or any of you? I have not heard of it. I, I've heard of it. I'm not familiar with it. Um... For me, it's more appropriate to have uh, crying yoga because I'm not <laughs> physically flexible. And so it's it's often an uncomfortable experience to try to contort myself. I know they say, take it easy, but I'm really inflexible. My dad um, never called me. Downward exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm concerned about how laughing while doing yoga may, may physically, I, I would be afraid of losing like control of certain, you know, bodily function if I'm laughing and stretching in a certain way. I'm not really curious about laughter yoga. So if anybody in the audience knows and wants to share more. I can barely do warrior one with my breath held. So I don't know if I could laugh and do it at the same time. It sounds impressive. If you can do it <laughs> and not immediately go to your uh, physical therapist the next day, like I do. Anyway, um, we have another question in the chat. Someone asks, what brand of humor is your favorite? For example, dad jokes, blue humor, dark humor, et cetera. Nadine, let's start with you on this one. Yeah, I have two kinds. Um, I am first generation Lebanese. Um, so any type of humor that just makes fun of the trauma that you go through growing up, uh, with, in any type of ethnic household, right, uh, is on brand for me. So Sebastian Maniscalco comes to the top of mind, just making fun of his father all the time, his Sicilian father and, you know, the differences with his side of the family and his wife. So anything that pokes fun at, at just that, as well as anything that just pokes fun is, like I said, the absurdity of the world around us um, and, and does so in a way to highlight it and bring it to the forefront so we can actually have conversations about it. Um, George Carlin, right? I mean, one of the best of the best, like, you know, so those are my two, my two brands. I would say um, uh, comedy that pushes the limits of where we are right now. And I don't mean that like um, necessarily like a blue comedy uh, is just like dirty humor. Um, but conceptually, um, I think, uh, hey, back in the day, uh, when I was 11 years old, a movie came out, which changed the comedy landscape forever. And it was called Dumb and Dumber. And for an 11 year old boy, that was the holy grail of comedy. And I think it's because actor like Jim Carrey, who's um, I think maybe even can be view, viewed at now as cliche because he, he made such an impact and it seems like old school, but uh, a combination of physical comedy and uh, witty uh, responses and, and just dialogue um, as a kid that just, it made me feel like the world was a better place, 
you know? Um, and uh, I would say like, and there's some conversations, there's stuff we did on the main stage that, I mean, was we had shows we'd want to mail off to the Smithsonian and then uh, some other ones that we didn't want to see the light of day, but some of the conversations we had after hours or even in the dressing room, like um, just the absurdity with how the, our, like going back and forth with other community uh, with other comedians with no no limits on the conversation um, was really um, quite great. And I will add, uh, like we talked about earlier, with comedy being a good way to convey certain points to certain people, I think comedy as a genre um, can address some of the issues that divide our nation and our world uh, in a way that uh, people otherwise wouldn't listen to together. So. Um, what, like with the George Carlin talking about the government um, and and how things are screwed up, you know, people can laugh at that and then say, well, yeah, that's a good point. And then, you know, really just diffuse these situations or like I've heard the comedians like B Bill Burr talk about abortion, you know, and the two sides of that and, and usually two sides of those kinds of issues, wedge issues don't sit down to the table and laugh together. So. So then it brings it back to humor can be a social connection and the charm and disarm. Sean, what about you? Do you have favorite kinds of comedy? I know you yourself seem to have a, a very dry wit and use a lot of self-deprecating humor. Yes, I. my general rule is I only tell jokes that I think are funny so that if no one else laughs, at least I'm entertained. <laughs> so that's that's like my rule. Um, but I to, to Daniel's point, I, I do like using humor to sort of point out so like an uncomfortable truth in a situation in a way that is like, um, yeah, it's hard to get upset at it because I usually use myself as as the focus. And so if someone is, if I'm disagreeing with somebody, I'll make a joke about how I'm struggling to understand that issue that I actually disagree on. And so the, the person often will, will laugh and realize like, oh, you're making fun of yourself. I, I can't criticize you or come back at you with an argument because like you're, you're just pointing something out and it's a, I, I enjoy just sort of throwing out um, some, some, some observations in that way to, to sort of bring down the, the tension sometimes. That is excellent. I just want to note too, we had an audience member write in some helpful information in the chat. They noted that laughter yoga, which someone had asked about before, is a practice of doing silly things or breathing exercises that bring on laughter. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing. That reminds me a bit of the Ministry of Silly Walks and how people would um, practice Classic. Them. Speaking of Monty Python, um, uh, both Nadine and Daniel have noted that you know, their family history of comedy has a big influence on them. And uh, one of the things that's true of myself and my family, I also come from an Irish family, my siblings and I will go on rants of basically conversations that are direct movie quotes from movies we grew up with and my mom would be like I'm, I'm so confused about what you guys are talking about and usually my sister would be like all right let me break it down they're quoting this movie and you know, they're jumping over to this movie and so it's a it's a nice way of connecting um, with your with your family with your community it's it's good times those are excellent points we had a couple more suggestions and questions come in as to where um, humor that people enjoy. Someone recommended Bob and Ray, uh, and they note, for example, the interview with the Komodo dragon expert. It's good to know. Um, another question asks, do you use sound or music to lighten up? It is in, in general, absolutely. Yeah, I, music, uh, I'll play sound baths, you know, uh, on my phone through Apple Music or whatnot, or Zen like meditation music. I, I don't watch a lot of television. I tend to go like weeks and then just binge it for a couple of days and then come at it. So yes, I'm ve I very much absorb my surroundings a lot. So I have to be intentional and curate um, a surrounding that can keep me balanced. And so music plays a big part in that as well as meditation. Um, with sound baths playing in the background, absolutely. Or honestly, I'll sometimes will just play comedy in the background. Uh, you know, I'll put something up on YouTube, just hearing the laughter, honestly, in and of itself can lighten me up as well. 
Um, I will, I definitely do uh, use music. I listen to a lot of music, use it to help motivate me to work out. Um, but also I'm all over the map and I'm a theater kid, um, at least partially. So I'll have people, there's an investigator who works in my office who deals with some very serious thing. He'll come in, want to talk about something. I've got the uh, Broadway soundtrack or score to Annie playing, uh, which I think gives me a nice, like, unstable vibe. You don't want to screw with a lawyer who's doing very serious stuff, <laughs> listening to um, It's a Hard Knock Life. Excellent point. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite lawyer joke? Mm. <laughs> There's one from Better Call Saul that's funny if people had heard it it's a little crude and i'm not saying see don't get me wrapped up in this blue comedy thing but um i think it goes something like how are lawyers like sperm i don't know is the response and then it goes well one in three million <laughs> has a chance of becoming a viable human being i thought really, that was pretty fun. it's great it's a really, really good joke. I can only think of one off the top of my head. And, and my dad actually told it to me. So is that a twofer, like a dad lawyer joke? Uh, and he loves it. He's been telling it to me ever since I passed the bar almost 20 years ago. So a man, you know, hasn't spoken to his attorney in quite some time. So he calls the office and the receptionist answers. And she says, hello. And he says, yes, may I speak to, you know, uh, uh, Jack? And she's like, sir, I, I'm so sorry. You must have not heard the news, but Jack died. He's like, oh, God, okay, well, you know. So sorry, and he hangs up. A week later, he calls back again. Same receptionist answers. He goes, yes, hi, you know, so-and-so, I'm here to call Jack. She's like, sorry, I think, I think I talked to you last week. I didn't told you, Jack, die. He's like, oh, that's right. Okay, so he hangs up third time. A week later, he calls, same exact conversation. He says, sir, I've talked to you twice before. I know I've told you, Jack, that why do you keep calling? He's like, I know, I just really like hearing you say it. <laughs> My dad loves that joke. Oh, he loves telling it to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's all i can think of good that was good is <laughs> out there so who are some of your favorite performers that was one question that was in the chat or the q a are there people that you draw from or inspired by? I think it, it, it you know, I think it, a lot of comedians like to have these offshoot sources of information so they can seem like they're really into the scene and whatnot. But if you've ever seen a lot of the Will Ferrell stuff on Saturday Night Live, that isn't the major ones that people know him from. Um, there's something called the Bad Doctor sketch, which was amazing. There's also Terrence Maddox. He was a, a homeless man who poses nude in art classes uh, for money. And his, some of his work on that is like, people can't keep it together. Um, so, but, and I, and I, I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm necessarily such a big fan of his, and they're funny, but the movies that he's been doing recently, um, they seem similar roles uh, to me, but I feel like he was, he came out of the Groundlings in LA, um, which one of my former, the guys who was on the main stage and, and um, in Boston is now a, a groundling there. Um, but he's really funny. Um, yeah, so Will Ferrell's uh, deep cuts, I would say, are, are, are uh, something that tickles me quite a bit. That's always great to know about more skits he has. And there's some that I just love watching him in, like the cheerleaders and um, the cowbell one that are classics, but that's that's great to know too, to look for others. I just wanna bring in some people who added in um, information in the chat. So we had someone uh, on Laughter Yoga noting that was developed by Dr. Kataria from India. 
We have another person note that humor brings the right brain into the equation, which is desperately needed by literal thinking left brain lawyers. And let's see, we had somebody else had a suggestion on performers. Uh, they note that at the Bell in Hand, every Tuesday there's comedy night where emerging and established stand-up comedians can register with host Andrew Della Volpe. And then they give the event right length to do it. Thank you all for sharing information. Uh, we have another question. In any of your trials or hearings or et cetera, has the judge ever told a joke that was bad, but you had to laugh to not upset him or her? Daniel, what do you think? Um, probably. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think uh, in any, like, uh, I probably do more arbitrations and mediations than um, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the work I do settles before we get to the courtroom, sometimes right before we get to the courtroom. Um, but, um, it, and, and I deal with like wrongful death and like sexual assault. So the judge being a little jazzy up there on the mic might uh, come off the wrong way. But I've, I think I've certainly um, had like a mediator um, try and diffuse the situation or, or make a joke. Um, one, actually very prominent uh, Brian, uh, Brian Moan is uh, he he mediated the um, station fire cases in, in Rhode Island that big fire and so he's highly regarded as the best mediator or one of the uh, ones you would use for huge cases and uh, he's been in a number of um, Fairly Brothers movies He's, he's buds with the Fairley brothers. And so I think he's in like me, myself and Irene as a judge and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I would say I've certainly been uh, circumstances where the, um, the, uh, the person of authority there is trying to be funny. And you're like, ha, 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 ha. Good, good one, good one. And you got to walk it out. Not on the judge side, but definitely with like somebody is Daniel just said the position of authority in the room, whether that's the CEO or or, or whomever. And depending on my relationship with them, right? If it, if I have that deep seated established relationship yet, I, I will laugh it off. But then with a simultaneous internal monologue, like wanting to die, saying like you can do, you know, you can do this, maybe, and it's okay. Um, but if I actually do have a good relationship, I might even call them out on it. I might just be like, not your best. Not, you know, or just, you know, something where you're not saying it's bad, you know, you're giving them some, some uh, runway that you know that they, they've got it in them, right? And then it's like, well, you know, I tried or whatever. So it, it depends on the relationship with the person that I've had to grit my teeth and laugh many, many times. So many people felt important. So, yeah. Those are great. I, I, I will say that I have used humor with those people to try and cut through some of the, the, formality and just be like hey look see i'm a i'm a normal person uh i can be funny what are we doing here? like look let's just get this done today so that we don't have to keep doing it or you know over and over again let's let's see if we can cut through some of the formality with the fact that we're humans we've got busy schedules can we can we nail it down today those are all great points great. A brief oh, sorry, I was gonna say there was another question that actually, I think what Daniel just said would answer that really well is how do you get over the uncomfortable pause when meeting a new client or waiting for the client to respond? We have somebody who encounters this quite often when acting as a neutral in a conciliation and mediation. To Daniel's just point, I, I actually tried to just establish a human connection first before you know jumping the gun and saying, putting on my lawyer hat, so to speak, or them as a client. Just talk to them as I would talk to anybody else. If it's a new client, again, it completely depends on who's on the other side of the table, but if it's a new client or somebody like, like that, that might be nervous, may, you know, might be worried about saying the wrong thing or not know how to present themselves or carry themselves, just act like a human, just get to know them as a person. And, and then, you know, a couple minutes, just cut the ice and then, you know, pivot into whatever the objective of the meeting is. To, to expand upon that, that perfectly. Right? Um, I, uh, I've, I meet a lot of sexual assault victims and I can, you know, to meet me, you know, I'm six foot three, uh, look like a frat guy. Um, you know, I can say something like that, address the, the elephant in the room. Like, I understand how difficult this must be to explain this to someone who looks like me, uh, you know, 
et cetera, um, yada, 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 uh, and then get down to it. Um, but also, um, you know, coming forward and, and, and displaying your humanity and being like, look, I understand this has been a very difficult situation. Um, and I could sit here and pound on the desk and tell you, you know, I basically illustrate what my lawyer role would be, but put it in a context that's like kind of makes it, you know, out to be less human. <laughs> like I could sit here and pound on the desk and tell you what a terrible client you have, but I'm not going to because I want to see what we can get done today. You know, just little bits here and there. Those are good thoughts. We had someone um, bravely note in the audience with regard to the question about judges that they would sometimes uh, let the judge know that they were bad and then they would both laugh. Uh, we had someone else share an article in the Harvard Business Review about the benefits of laugh laughing in the office, which we have reshared with everyone. Um, thank you for addressing about the uncomfortable pause. And I think we had another question over here. Let's see. Oh, we had someone suggest that um, Improv Boston uh, has no stage yet, but has friend who has taken classes there and may have a space for classes coming in Cambridge again. Oh, and someone else asks, um, are there upcoming events where we can see you quote on stage? Nadine, let's start with you on that one. Muted, can you guys still hear me okay? I think one mm -hmm. of the earbuds died. Okay, great, we have a couple minutes. Admittedly, none for me, uh, for those of you listening in. I just started my own firm a year ago. So that is taking up really any and all time and space I have. That being said, it is a goal of mine to get back on stage. I've been writing in my spare time. It's wildly therapeutic. So a goal for 2023 is to get back on stage. So none yet for me, but stay tuned. Um, no, uh, I met my wife in COVID. She's never seen me perform. Um, and uh, and I, I would, now that I'm, uh, I would perform at, at a show called uh, Vanity Project on Wednesdays at Improv Asylum um, on Hanover Street in the North End, um, just before COVID. They were having like di different alumni come back and, and perform with some of their main stage cast. Um, and I don't think they brought that show back. Um, and so, you know, like sketch and improv is really what I do. Um, I had not done stand up, even though I could try my hand at it, but I just had a baby about six months ago and uh, that child is receiving my brightest and best efforts at making him laugh. Congratulations on your new baby and on starting your new firm, both such wonderful um, and big adventures for you. Well, we hope that we can see you on stage again at some point soon. We are coming towards the end of time. I wanna note that we're so glad you joined us today. Uh, as noted, this is Wellbeing and Law Week. We are glad you're here. We have another webinar for busy lawyers tomorrow here at LCL. It'll be 12 p.m. noon with Dr. Tracy Myers on mindfulness. There are also a lot of other well-being uh, events in law. You can go to lclma.org for a schedule and also lawyerwellbeingma.org has a full schedule as well for activities around the state. Um, I wanna thank all of our audience members, Dr. Sean, Daniel, Nadine, um, and I will go around for closing remarks from each of you. Dr. Sean, um, thank you so much. And do you have closing thoughts for us as we wrap up about uh, the importance of laughter and humor? I got nothing. No, I mean, <laughs> I think any way that you can find opportunity to laugh, uh, even to yourself, um, there's lots of benefits to that. So start there. Great point. Nadine? just do our best to not lose our humanity and what it is that we're doing. And remember why we started this Well, Most of us should hopefully have started it to be able to make an impact and help people. So just not lose sight of that and that it is okay and actually healthy to use humor from time to time. And so try your best to just kind of be authentic and do that, so. Basically just echoing what was just said. Um, I've certainly had times where I felt like I was losing my ability to laugh and uh, come to the realization that whatever I'm sacrificing 
uh, whatever I think I'm sacrificing my humor for, whether it be more money, uh, more prestige, whatever, to look more serious, isn't worth it. Uh, because I'm, when you're not laughing, you're not enjoying life. And I don't care how important I think I am. <laughs> I'm not that important. Those are all great tips. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your wit with us. Thank you to everybody who chimed in also with the chat with their um, information. And we encourage you all to find the humor um, and charm and connectivity in life with this. So thank you all so much for joining us for a laugh a day. All right, take care. We'll close out. Bye-bye.